yield. Um, right, so my lecture today will um, firstly look at how do viruses spread, what types of insect vectors are there, how do the insects actually transmit the viruses, what interactions viruses, vectors and hosts have, so how virus, vector and host affect each other. And then how do we control virus diseases by targeting the vectors? <clears throat> right. So we will start with how viruses spread. Viruses are parasites, they're obligate parasites, um, and they need to live in a in a living cell and the hosts of the virus are sedentary. The hosts don't move. So the virus has to get between different hosts. Very different case to COVID-19 where the host moves around. So if we don't move around with that disease and we stay at home, the virus can't spread. Different matter with plants. The viruses, the plants do stay at home so the vectors have to spread the disease. Viruses have an additional problem in plants in that they can't <clears throat> directly penetrate the plant cell because the plant has a cell wall, very hard cell wall around the cell. <clears throat> so the virus has to get break through the cell wall and get into the internal parts of the cell to cause an infection and vectors are one very good way of doing that. So how do plant viruses spread? Quite a range of different ways. Mechanical contact, like secateurs, knives, something. Vegetative propagation, you have infected tubers, sugarcane, potatoes, many bulbs, cassava. If the planting material is infected, it produces infected plants. Tissue culture is just another form of vegetative propagation. So it's very good for transmission. Viruses can be spread by grafting. So putting an infected scion onto a plant and grafting it cause, can cause transmission. Parasitic plants like dodder that don't have chlorophyll themselves, but they feed on other plants, they can transmit viruses by acting like a pipe. Some viruses are transmitted in seed. Some viruses are transmitted by pollen. But the vast majority of viruses are transmitted by a vector of some sort. That's an animal or a fungus or a protist, nematode, an insect, that will carry the virus from plant to plant. And of these vectors, arthropods, which are insects and mites, are by, by far the most common, common sort of vector. And of these insects and mites, the vast majority are transmitted by aphids and by white flies. So most of this lecture will be about these aphid and whitefly vectors of plant viruses. Now, vector transmission was initially thought to be passive. What we mean is the insect would just take up the virus from the plant and inject it into another plant and that was the end of the process, very simple. They used to be thought of as what we call flying syringes. So just a needle and syringe full of sap and just inject one plant from another. But now we know that's not true. It's very highly specific active process. It's a very complicated process. Just to show you quickly what insects do transmit viruses. This is a phylogenetic tree of um, insect orders. The red stars are orders of insects 
where virus vectors are known. But the vast majority are in the Hemiptera and the Thysanoptera. Thysanoptera are thrips. And Hemiptera, if we go up here, <clears throat> Hemiptera include insects like white flies, psyllids, mealybugs, aphids, plant hoppers and leaf hoppers. So these are the most common virus vectors. What do these vectors look like? These are aphids, the most common type of virus vector. Some aphids have a very wide host range, Mises persicae, Aphis crucifera, Aphis cassipii. They can feed on dozens and dozens of different species of plants. Mises persicae, for instance, is known to transmit over 100 viruses, 100 different viruses. 30 different viruses recorded for Aphis crucifera. Other aphids, though, are very host specific. The banana aphid, it's got a very limited range of viruses that it transmits, including banana bunchy top virus. So these are examples of the other types of vectors. White um, leaf hoppers, transmitting, for instance, rice tungro virus, rice dwarf virus. White flies, which you would be very familiar with in Indonesia. The two main vector species are trialuroides, um, the greenhouse white fly, or Bermisia tabasi, tobacco or sweet potato white fly. Plant hoppers transmit to quite a range of viruses, including, for instance, rice grassy stunt, Nilla pavata. Mealybugs transmit viruses, viruses of pineapple, pineapple mealybug wilt associated viruses or badna viruses like banana streak virus. And some transmitted by beetles, thrips, um, ooh, psyllids and uh, mites. Now, how do the viruses or how do the um, insects feed? The two main ways these insect vectors feed on plants, most of them have piercing sucking mouth parts. That's a stylet, like a straw that they feed with. Most of the studies have been done with aphids and increasingly on white flies, but other work has been done on the other types. Most of these insects eventually feed on the phloem tissue, the, the sugar and nutrient transport system in the plant. So they use a stylet eventually to feed on the phloem tissue. Some viruses are transmitted by, by beetles. And these beetles chew plants. They don't feed on the phloem, they just chew the leaves up, especially on the parenchyma cells. A number of different virus genera are transmitted this way, but it's not near as common as piercing sucking mouth parts. So we'll talk mostly about aphids, but what I say about aphids is mostly true for white flies as well. These two very common types of vectors. Now, aphids, in the cold climates, like the north of Europe, go through a life cycle where they have males and females, they lay eggs over the winter time to get them through the winter and then hatch again in the warm weather in springtime and summer. That's called a whole holocelic life cycle. <clears throat> but in tropical warm climates, subtropics and tropics, this doesn't happen. The life cycle is anholocyclic which means they don't go through an egg phase and the aphids are parthenocarpic. That means the population is totally female and they lay live young, no eggs. 
And this is the common situation in Australia, in Indonesia. There are two main forms of adult aphids, wingless or apteri aphids. This is Mises persicae here with no wings and adult or winged or alate aphids. One here, you can see the wings there. The winged aphids are the most common type of form of the vector because they can move much more easily from plant to plant than an aphid walking from plant to plant. Much quicker if they fly. And just very quickly, the aphids have piercing sucking mouth parts, a stylet. You can see down in the bottom right hand corner, uh, that's a pea aphid feeding on a plant through its stylet. <clears throat> on the left, is a close up of the tip of the stylet. And if we cut across the stylet here, you can see there are two main holes or tubes there. The food canal where food goes up from the phloem into the aphid and the salivary canal where the aphid injects saliva into the plant. So into the plant through here, out of the plant through here. <clears throat> And it's only these inner stylets that get injected into the phloem tissue. Right, how do aphids feed? This is a, a section of an aphid feeding on a plant. This is the aphid stylet. And this is the track its stylet has taken. Goes through the epidermis, through the parenchyma cells, just tasting them, probing them as it goes through, and eventually it reaches the phloem tissue. <clears throat> when it reaches the phloem tissue, that might take even take hours to get to the phloem tissue. <clears throat> it injects with the inner stylets into the phloem tissue, injects a little bit of saliva. The saliva has has the properties to stop phloem cells from clogging up, um, which is a plant defense mechanism. So it keeps the flow going in the um, phloem cells. And then it starts sucking up the phloem contents through its food canal. It's injecting saliva through the saliva canal and then sucking up contents um, through the food canal. Right, so this feeding behavior of aphids to probe a little bit on the outer cells and then go to the phloem tissue is used by different ways, by different types of viruses. There's more than one way that the aphids will transmit diseases. <clears throat> the first way is we call non-circulative transmission. And this occurs with viruses that infect all the different cell types of a plant, but they're especially high concentration in the epidermis and mesophyll. Viruses like this that are common in Indonesia would be chili venal mottle virus, cucumber mosaic virus, papaya ring spot virus. The virus is being obtained by the aphid in these cells near the surface when it does its very first exploratory tasting probes. After the virus, after the aphid has settled down and decided it likes to feed on that species of host, it gets to the phloem tissue. Some viruses infect only the phloem tissue. They don't infect these other cell types, just the phloem tissue. So for an aphid to be a vector of these viruses, it has to feed on the phloem. The plant has to be a host of the virus and the aphid. In this case, the virus circulates through the body of the aphid during the transmission process. So it's called circulative transmission. So non-circulative and circulative, two different types of transmission used by different viruses with different replication strategies. 
So we'll quickly look at non-circulative transmission. Um, so this is transmission where the aphid is just feeding on these um, epidermal cells and mesophyll cells, and parenchyma cells. Viruses replicate to a higher level in these cells. The virus is picked up through brief probes, it can just be a few seconds. And it doesn't matter if the host, if the plant is a host of the aphid or not, because the aphid is just doing its initial tasting to see if it's a host. And during this process, it can pick up the virus very quickly. If you starve aphids, keep them from feeding for a few hours before you do this, these transmission tests, the aphid will be very hungry. It'll probe very quickly and you'll get uh, increased rates of transmission. Um, most of the time, these types of viruses can be transmitted by a large number of or many different aphid species. They don't have to be hosts of the, the plant. <clears throat> many different aphids can do the job. There's no latent period. That means as soon as the virus is picked up by the aphid, it can be immediately re-inoculated into another plant. It can take, within a few seconds, you can pick the virus up and infect another plant. The aphid loses its ability to transmit after it molts. So aphids go through um, juvenile stages where they shed their exoskeleton. So exoskeleton stops them growing. So they've got to shed their exoskeleton when they um, reach a certain st stage of growth and then grow a new exoskeleton. The lining of the mouth parts where the virus is sticking is part of the exoskeleton. So it's like the skin peeling off and the inside of the mouth peeling off as well, which can't be very pleasant. Um, so infectivity is lost after molting. It can pick, pick it up again, but every time the aphid molts, it loses its ability to transmit. The virus doesn't multiply in the vector. The vector is just carrying it. The, vir the aphid is not infected, it's just a carrier. The virus doesn't last very long on the stylets, minutes or hours generally. After that time, it's all gone. Um, many different viruses are transmitted this way. And it's often not a very simple strategy. It's not just the tip of the stylet becoming contaminated with virus. It's a very specific mechanism happening. So if we look at this diagram, um, we, uh, <clears throat> on the left hand side, <clears throat> we're looking at non circulative transmission still and how helper components and capsid strategies are involved in transmission. So, here we have an aphid, which is feeding on a plant. <clears throat> this is the stylet. If we magnify the tip of the stylet, <clears throat> some viruses like cucumber mosaic virus bind to a specific receptor on the wall of the stylet. The stylet is in the orange color here, the outside. And this is the, the inside, the food canal area. <clears throat> There's a specific receptor on the stylet, and there are specific structures on the coat protein of the virus that match the receptor. If the aphid has this receptor and the virus has the right coat protein, it will stick to the stylet when the aphid feeds and the virus passes up through the stylet. Then when the aphid injects saliva again, it can be washed back off. So that's a specific binding. It's not sticking to nothing. It's sticking to a receptor. 
That's the simplest form. Other viruses like potiviruses, like cucumber, um, chili venal mottle virus, um, the virus actually produces a protein when it's infecting a cell, which binds to the receptor and the virus binds to the protein. So the virus is more or less producing a glue that sticks the virus particle um, to the stylet. Cauliflower mosaic virus has a similar system. <clears throat> there are other strategies, other forms of transmission that are less common. We won't talk about those in this presentation. Semi-persistent, but they have similar binding strategies in the stylet. <clears throat> so if we look at that helper component that I've just mentioned, a potivirus particle <clears throat> has nucleic acid in the center of the particle, coat protein around these dark purple balls, coat protein around the outside to protect the RNA. The coat protein has a particular amino acid motif, DAG, which is aspartic acid, threonine glycine, DAG. That's the most common form. That binds to a specific amino acid sequence on the helper component protein. Um, where are we? KITC, lysine, isoleucine, threonine, cysteine. And that binds, oh, sorry, that binds there. <clears throat> My voice is going, I'll have a quick drink of water. <laughs> <clears throat> that again, the DAG motif binds to the PTK motif, <clears throat> which is protein threonine, spelling mistake, and lysine. And the other side of the helper component binds to the receptor via another specific amino acid sequence. So you'll see the virus needs to code for three separate amino acid sequences in two different proteins to be transmitted by a particular aphid species. Now it's not simple, but it's a very complicated system, but potiviruses that use this strategy are one of the most common types of viruses known in plants. So it's very, very successful. <clears throat> right, so that was non-circulative transmission because the virus just sticks to the stylet of the aphid. Um, the other main type of transmission is circulative or persistent transmission. This is called circulative because the virus circulates through the vector's body and it's called persistent because it lasts a long time, not minutes or hours, but days or weeks in the vector. Most of the time the virus is just circulating and it doesn't infect the vector. So they do not replicate in the vector. But some viruses of plants do actually replicate their propagative. So as well as circulating in the body, they also replicate in the vector. So these viruses are actually viruses of insects as well as viruses of plants. But most of the ones we'll look at are non-propagative and they do not replicate. And Begamo viruses, the white fly transmitted viruses producing bright yellow mosaics and leaf curls that are very common in your vegetable plants, are this type of virus, non propagative, circulative. <clears throat> right, <clears throat> so these viruses, as I said, are generally limited to the phloem tissue. That means the virus. <clears throat> the aphid or the white fly has to feed on the phloem tissue to inoculate and to acquire the virus. That means the insect has to like feeding on the plant, making the plant probably a host of that insect as well as a host of the virus. So they're far more vector specific. Any old aphid is not good enough. It's got to be a particular species of aphid to do the transmitting. 
um, the virus circulates through the body. Um, so there is what we call a latent period. It takes time for this to happen. This latent period could be several hours up to several days. The infectivity is not lost when the aphid molts because the virus is inside the aphid's body. It lasts for a long time, I said, and it's re-inoculated with the saliva during feeding. <clears throat> and <clears throat> this looks complicated, but we won't, <clears throat> won't go into a lot of detail. <clears throat> this shows how complicated the circulative transmission <clears throat> of a virus, circulative transmitted virus is. This is something like um, potato leaf roll virus or um, pepper yellow leaf curl virus to be transmitted in this manner. <clears throat> the insect feeds on a plant. If you follow the cursor, the virus goes into the gut, into the stomach, into the either mid gut or hind gut, depending on what virus and <clears throat> um, vector it is. Somewhere in here, the virus moves out of the gut, through the gut lining, into the blood system, the, hem the hemocell, travels through the blood system up to the stylet, up to the salivary glands. It moves through the salivary glands and gets re-injected when the insect feeds again. So it does a whole circuit through the vector's body. <clears throat> and if we look at the virus being here in the gut, this is a magnification. The virus gets placed in vesicles. It hijacks a, a normal cell process. The virus gets put into membrane bound vesicles and transported across the cells into the blood system. The blood system here is magnified here, then out of the blood system through the, the supporting structure for the salivary glands, once again through vesicles, into the salivary ducts, and then back into the salivary gland and back into the plant. <clears throat> so very complicated process and very, very specific because the vector has to feed on the phloem tissue for it to start. Otherwise, the virus is not acquired. When the virus is acquired, <clears throat> it has to get through the gut wall. That's one barrier. The virus can get through there, but once it's into the hemocell, it has to get through the basal lamina, has to get through this stage. It's another barrier. Once it gets into here, it's got to be able to be transported across the salivary gland into the salivary duct. That's a third barrier. Now, a virus can get through one. If it doesn't get through two, it's not transmitted. If it gets through one and two, but not three, still not transmitted. It's got to get through every barrier to be transmitted. So that, that looks incredibly complicated. But this mechanism is the mechanism used by whitefly transmitted Gemini viruses. So once again, very, very successful method of transmission, despite being complicated. Very, very common. <clears throat> so this just summarizes what I've been saying there. The non-circulative types, they're acquired and transmitted very quickly. The circulative types, much more slowly. <laughs> Arif, I hope that's a coffee you're drinking. <laughs> yeah. um, the latent period, no latent period with non-circulative. Um, no delay at all. Long latent periods with circulative transmission. Lost very quickly with non-circulative. Retained for a long time with um, circulative transmission. Uh, someone's got their microphone on. It make it difficult for everybody else. <clears throat> um, the non-circulative types 
are not present in the blood system in the body of the aphid, they don't multiply and they're not transmitted to the young. The circulative types are present in the blood system and the ones that propagate in the vector sometimes even transmit the virus to their young. <clears throat> so very two very different types of transmission, but both very, very successful. <clears throat> okay. So that's how many different vectors move from plant to plant and the very complicated ways that the vectors actually are involved in transmitting the virus. So what we've looked at at the moment is mostly how the virus and the, um, how the vector directly picks the virus up from an infected plant. But there's even more to it than that. Um, the virus and the vector and the host have a lot of complicated interactions. And this is a very active area of study at the moment. We're learning a lot, but there's still many, many more questions than there are answers. And for a, an insect vector to actually feed on the plant and acquire the virus, there's several factors involved. Firstly, there's visual and chemical attraction to the plant because aphids don't, or whiteflies don't recognize the plant by sight. They can't recognize what a banana or a chili is by looking at it. They generally have to determine that there's a plant present and then there'll be chemical attraction on the plant. The plant gives off volatile chemicals. Um, and that can give an indication of whether the, the vector thinks it will feed on the, try feeding on the plant or not. Um, if it lands on the plant, it then will do an initial assessment of the plant to see if it's likely to be a host. It will start probing the epidermal and the mesophyll cells to see what it tastes like. If it doesn't taste right, it might fly straight away. If it thinks it's on the right plant, then it will try to find the phloem and start feeding on the phloem tissue. So in step three here, the non-persistent viruses can be transmitted in very short exploratory probes. In step four, the phloem transmitted viruses can be transmitted. <clears throat> and some of the ways these interactions work, are the, virus, the viruses can affect how the vector will feed on a plant. Um, vectors are often attracted by the color of the plant. Infected plants are often more yellow than healthy plants. And the vectors are often attracted by yellow colors. So they're attracted to the, to the look of the plant. The volatiles that they give off, the smell of the plant can attract the vector. The nutrient levels in the phloem tissue when a plant is infected by a virus, the transport system and the nutrients in the phloem can change. They can have different levels of amino acids and sugars. And quite often, especially in um, with persistently transmitted viruses that infect the phloem, the infected phloem is a better source of food for the vector than a healthy plant. So the vector has increased fitness you get more vectors produced on an infected plant than on a healthy plant, though so that helps the spread of the virus. The virus can also affect the taste of the cells and many other signals. The amount of time that the vector will spread, will, will spend probing the epidermal and mesophyll cells can be changed by virus infection it can make the virus, the vector probe much more quickly on those cells and pick the virus up more quickly. Or it can make the, with different types of viruses, it can make the vector reach the phloem tissue much more quickly and transmit the phloem limited viruses more quickly. <clears throat> so all these effects, the virus infecting the plant has all these effects indirectly on the vector 
helping the vector spread the virus. <clears throat> One way these um, feeding behaviours are examined is by electrical penetration graphs, EPGs, and um, and Puck Panama is d doing work on this, for instance, some very good work in our banana bunchy top project. Um, <clears throat> basically, an electrode is placed on the insect through a circuit and earthed into the pot. And the conductivity through this, um, the insect stylet is measured on a graph. So as it does reaches different parts of the, the, uh, the plant cells, the mesophyll cells, the xylem, the sieve elements, you get different types of feeding patterns. And you can plot this against time. And you can see in this case that the aphid was finding its way down through the mesophyll tissue. It reached the xylem. Aphids feed on the xylem to get a drink of water. Then it's probing around again, found the sieve element, a different pattern. And you can tell how long it fed on the phloem, how long it took to get to the phloem tissue. So you can look at all the different signals that the plants are producing and see how that affects aphid feeding. Right, and viruses can directly affect how a vector feeds as well as indirectly. Quite often viruses, um, uh, so quite often when a, uh, a vector is not infective, it prefers to feed on an infected plant. When the vector is infective, carrying the virus, it can prefer to feed on a healthy plant. So people do choice tests with the vectors and infected and healthy plants. And by this mechanism, an aphid or a white fly that not carrying the virus would prefer to feed on a plant that's infected. Once it's infected, it prefers then to move on to another healthy plant and spread the virus. It said um, aphid saliva can prevent um, sieve tubes blocking meaning the virus can be picked up far more easily in the um, sieve tube contents. Another direct effect is um, with there's been studies with tomato yellow leaf curl China virus, which is a white fly transmitted Begamo virus. The beta satellite produces a protein, the C1 protein, which actually suppresses jasmonic acid pathway in the um, resistance pathway in plants. It also reduces the synth synthesis of terpenes, which are toxic to aphids and white flies, white fly in this case. So a virus protein is actu actually modifying the metabolic pathways in the plant to favour the white fly. If it favours the white fly, it's more likely to be able to spread the, the virus. So as I said, this is a very active area of work and there are a lot more questions than there are answers. The data is often a bit confusing with the non-persistently transmitted, non-circulating viruses, but it's far more consistent with the circulatively transmitted viruses like the Bogomo viruses and Luteo and Polero viruses. There seems to be genuine tendencies, patterns there of vectors preferring to feed on infected plants and doing far better on infected plants than on healthy plants. And overall, all these modifying mechanisms tend to make the vector far more likely to spread the virus. It's a very complicated evolutionary process, but very effective. Right. So to be able to control vectors, it's very useful to know all that information that we were just talking about. If you know how the virus moves, how the, what encourages the vector to move, how the virus is transmitted by the vector, 
then you've got a much better chance of controlling the disease. And as I said, most of these viruses need vectors to spread. If there's no vector, there's no spread, so there's no disease. The very simplest way is avoiding having the vector there. You can do this by a number of means, mulches, which are um, coverings, soil coverings around and under the plants, um, either straw or reflective mulches, silver colored mulches. They upset the, the vector's landing signals and they confuse and they tend not to land on those plants. So if the vector doesn't land, it doesn't transmit the virus. So that can, can help avoid getting infected. Planting density can be important. Um, vectors are much more likely to land on isolated plants than a dense crop. They can see the soil around a, a plant and they recognize that as a plant far more easily. If it's a very thick planting with no soil, the vectors are much less likely to land on those plants. You can use, simply use netting over plants, very fine netting so the vectors can't get through. But of course, if you have holes in the netting or it's damaged or it's partly open, the vectors can get in and then they're often protected from their predators and they do even better than they would without the netting. So netting is very useful, but you have to be very careful. Um, another way is crop hygiene. If you remove old crops, which are likely to be more heavily infected than young crops, you can get rid of a lot of sources of infection. If the vectors have got nowhere to acquire the virus from, they're much less likely to transmit. You can control vectors with insecticides. This, for instance, is where it's very important to know the mechanism of transmission. Insecticides, most insecticides don't kill the vector instantly. It takes a while to kill the, kill the vector, even if it's 30 minutes. Remember the non-persistently, non-circulative viruses were acquired by the vector in a matter of a few seconds and they retransmit in a few seconds. So if, a, if an aphid lands on a um, cucumber plant with papaya ringspot virus, and it's been sprayed with insecticide, the aphid will taste the insecticide. It's the olfactory cue. It doesn't like it, so it immediately moves on to the next plant but it's already acquired the virus, so it spreads it very quickly. And the next plant has also been sprayed, so it moves on to another plant. So you often get very, um, uh, very quick spread of viruses in, of those sorts of viruses in plants that have been sprayed. You're better off not to spray in that case. The spraying actually encourages transmission. Um, another, yeah, yeah, what was I going to say? Um, oh, I forgot what I was going to say then. Um, another, another point <clears throat> is that with some insects like white flies in vegetable crops, you can have huge numbers of white flies present absolutely huge numbers. They can be also fairly efficient at transmitting the virus. Not every one will transmit, but maybe 20, 30, 40% of them will transmit. If you kill 90% of those insects with an insecticide, the 10% that are left are still plenty to cause epidemics. So unless you get 100% kill, it's not very effective. And the other problem with spraying like that is that you tend to produce resistance to the insecticide in the vector. 
and then the insecticide is useless totally. So in general, chemical control is not very effective in many with many virus diseases. Host resistance is something that can be quite useful. Um, we got, yeah. <clears throat> Just a couple of a couple of examples. I thought I'd show you this. This is a crop of tomatoes in Brisbane, a few kilometres away from where I work. We got an incursion of tomato yellow leaf curl virus. And that crop, tomato crop, is 100% infected with tomato yellow leaf curl virus. This virus is generally not a big problem anymore. White flies are being controlled, but that's not the main thing. Resistant varieties are being used, so resistant to the virus, and sources of elimination, um, sources of infection of the crop have been eliminated as well. So if you use all these means, the disease is fairly well controlled now. And one last one, one <clears throat> with resistance, the resistance doesn't have to be resistance of the plant to the virus. It can be resistance of the plant to the feeding of the vector or resistance of the plant to um, just a lighting or tasting of the plant by the vector. This is an example with tomato yellow leaf curl. There's a wild species of tomato, um, um, Solanum pimpinellifolium, I think it is, um, which has different sorts of glandular hairs. These are type four glandular hairs, they're called, compared to Lycopersicum esculentum, which is normal tomato. It has type five and six glandular hairs. So the hairs on the leaf are different in those two different species. It turns out that the gland, glandular trichomes type four produce acyl sucroses. So they produce a chemical that white flies don't like. It's repellent to white flies. And when there have been crosses done with tomatoes to introduce the type four glandular trichomes into tomatoes, <clears throat> you see Moneymaker, which is a conventional tomato, has a high level of infection, nearly 100% infection after 28 days. The resistant source, less than 20% infection. That's purely because the white flies don't like feeding on the tomato. If they feed on the tomato, it's infected. It's just as the tomato is susceptible to the virus. But it's just not a good host for the aphid or for the white fly. So the resistance can be to vectors as well as to the virus. So I think that's, that's about everything. <laughs> and I think that was the last time I was able to visit Bogor <laughs> since the COVID problems. <laughs> um, so yeah, in summary, vectors are a vital component of plant virus disease transmission. And to be able to control vectors, it's very important to know, would control vector transmitted diseases, it's very important to know how the diseases are transmitted and what the mechanism is. If you understand that, you've got a much better chance of controlling these diseases. So I'll leave it at that. Yep, so Thera Makassi. So, boot three. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. John, for the nice and very clear uh, presentation. I hope uh, many questions will rise, rising up. So, one of them is first from in the chat because maybe student. A little bit shy to yeah. directly asking to you I but uh, for the notes the participant today is 157 uh, participant right. uh, uh, very uh, i think almost uh, uh, five pathology student uh, 
that mm. come in here in uh, to attend your uh, lecture. Yes, so, I'm very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I can see lots of chat there. Okay, now the first question is from uh, Nur Hollis. Mm. The, for the food John, based on your explanation about AFID, you said AFID yeah. have two cycles and form uh, two form <laughs> of adult. Are there yeah. any difference of this cycle in the ability to spread the viruses? That's the question, the first question. <clears throat> I think right. you can answer directly. Yep. Okay. Um, it, not really. It, it can be lips, very small variations between the different forms, but um, the, the major difference you see in tropical areas is whether the aphids have wings or they don't have wings. Now, aphids will tend to colonize a, a plant and they, um, and then those aphids that are colonizing the plant will be wingless. Okay. They have no wings and they generally stay on the plant until their numbers build up so much that they're crowded or the plant's dying. And if there's a reason they need to move, then they produce a generation that has wings. And that aphids with wings will fly to another plant and start that cycle of wingless aphids again. So all of the, the winged and the wingless are both vectors, they both transmit fairly similarly, but it's the aphids with wings that are flying from plant to plant that are far more likely to transmit the virus because they can move to another plant very quickly and very easily. Many other, the wingless aphids are quite likely to die on the plant that they were born on. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Bagaimana Nurholis sudah cukup jelas. Jadi uh, kemampuan me menyebarkan virus itu lebih tinggi bagi yang bersayap daripada yang tidak bersayap ya. Karena bisa berpindah sangat jauh. Lalu kemudian kalau dilihat dari siklus hidupnya tadi, saya kira uh, tidak terlalu berbeda ya antara yang uh, yang wing dengan yang pakai uh, yang tanpa wing ya. Yeah. And I would just, just add to that, yeah. that most of our work is done with the wingless aphids because it's much more convenient. Yeah, for the reason that uh, yeah. <laughs> they don't fly away. Yes, <laughs> yes, for the reason that uh, no wing, it's uh, no uh, aphid with, without wing, it's uh, convenient yeah. to yes. work with. Okay, yeah. uh, the next question is, from Dian Reno in Indonesia, so I will, I will try to translate it. I hope it you will understand about my translation because my English is also not so good. <laughs> my Indonesian, I can assure you. <laughs> so uh, uh, this student asking about the uh, the persistency of virus outside of the house. Yeah. Uh, he said. Uh, he said it can persist for six hours, but uh, he, the period, the, the uh, Latin period, it's almost 20 hours. So mm -hmm. it means the virus can persist uh, or, or can uh, survive longer in uh, insect vector. So, uh, yeah. uh, uh, he asking about why uh, in uh, uh, vector, uh, virus can persist more than 20 hours. Right, it's a very good question. Um, the viruses can't s survive for very long outside the the body or uh, outside the cells. Um, we're just talking about the plant viruses now, <clears throat> but inside the vector, they're they're not within the cells, but they're within the, the vector's body and in the body fluids. And this is an area that's still subject to some debate there. They seem to be protected inside the vector. And 
Well, I didn't mention were that um, aphids and whitefly vectors have endosymbionts. So they have symbiotic bacteria that live inside their bodies and they excrete um, secrete proteins into the um, insect's blood system. And there's some evidence that some of those proteins can interact with the virus particles and protect them from being degraded. So, but there's a lot, a lot more questions there than answers, as I said. Yeah. Yeah. That... Yeah. Jan Reynolds, uh, sudah jelas dari penjelasan dokter itu, dokter John, atau harus saya translate nih? Pokoknya intinya, kenapa kau berusaha bertahan lama selama lebih dari 20 jam di dalam rubus serangga? Itu karena uh, virus itu bukan hidup di dalam sel, tetapi dalam body fluid serangga. Jadi di dalam cairan yang ada di dalam serangga, dan di sana ada bakteri simbion ya, yang menghasilkan protein yang bisa melindungi, yang bisa terikat dengan protein virus dan melindungi virus dari degradasi sehingga bisa lebih lama di dalam tubuh serangga. Mudah-mudahan cukup jelas ya, Dian Reno. Lalu berikutnya adalah uh, pertanyaannya Miftahur Rohmah itu tentang uh, nutrition level in the phloem will increase vector fitness. Ya. Uh, apakah Is it any relation with between the uh, uh, this is the, uh, the increase of uh, level nutrition in the phloem? Is it because of the virus infection or other fact or others? Um, it could could be both. Um, I, I know, for instance, that. When potatoes are infected with potato leaf roll virus, <clears throat> the leaves roll because the starch is not transferred to the tubers. So the leaves have a lot more starch and complex sugars in them than a healthy plant does. So that's the, the virus affecting the, the phloem tissue and the nutrients can't move out of the phloem tissue. Um, but yes, it could, it could be both. Be both. So in uh, virus infection can induce le uh, level of nutrition in the phloem increase. Yes. And the yep. increasing of the nutrition of uh, level yep. it's uh, it Uh, lead will fit, uh, increase also the uh, fitness of the vector. Yes, it's, it's, it's better, better nutrition, so it lives longer and oh. has more young. Oh. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I um, see a question from Wododo there. Yeah, that's many questions for you here. Yeah, I'll let you ask them. <laughs> uh, the next is from Prabhawati Hinta. Hi, John. Common knowledge yeah. I knew yeah. from some farmer here. They are okay. controlling aphid and bemisia using molasses. They said the result was good. Do you have any thought or maybe experiences about it? Thanks Thank you for in advance. Yes. Yeah. No, I don't, but that sounds quite interesting. Um, I imagine that's because of the stickiness of the molasses um, and not um, yeah, physi uh, physical trapping of the vector. I think that, yeah, I don't have any experience. That sounds quite interesting. I I just worry that maybe you might get sooty mold or fungal, fungal saprophytes on the leaf if you sprayed too much molasses or sugars around. But yeah, yeah it's no, no experience, but very interesting. I'll make a note of that. <laughs> Oke, okay, yeah. uh, okay. uh, Bapak, Ibu, dan Anda semua, ini pertanyaannya saya ada hulukan dulu yang dari mahasiswa ya. Tadi ada pertanyaan juga dari Pak Joko. Sabar ya Pak Joko. 
uh, the next question is from Rafi Ahmad, eh, Rafi, Arif Rafi. There are some information that surprise me, sir. Light infected vector can prefer to feed on healthy plant. Then non infected vector can prefer to feed on infected plant. How did it happen? Do you have any? Do you have the instinct to infect? It feels like zombie. <laughs> Yeah. Please. Yeah. So, what is what is the question? <laughs> the question uh, is, uh, how did it happen? How did it happen? Yeah. yeah. Why? The, uh, uh, well, like how do people? Yeah. How do people know? <laughs> um, that those sort that information is obtained by by preference feeding. So you will take infective vectors and then give them a choice of which plant they want to feed on. And they will tend, in the experiments that have been done, they've tended to feed on the healthy plants. And if you take healthy vectors and give them a choice, they'll tend to feed on the infected plants. They say the statistical differences between the feeding preferences. It doesn't mean that every healthy aphid will only feed on an infected plant. It is just a tendency. Yeah. Yeah. But that, but it's helping the helping the virus. It's a tendency in the right direction for the virus. Yeah. But I think this this phenomena uh, can show about the why uh, the virus infection in the field occurs. Uh, continu uh, continuously in the field because mm. of the behavior of the vector. I That's think. right. The vector is continually looking for some way to infect. Yeah, some way. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, uh, plant in, uh, infected by virus is more attractive than the healthy one. Yeah. yeah. But interestingly, some of the experiments have shown that with the virus infected plant, with the circulatively transmitted viruses where the feeding has to be on the phloem and for a long time, the the vectors will tend to live better on those plants and stay longer before they move. With some of the non-persistently transmitted viruses where the feeding is very brief, the opposite happens. The, the plant is encouraging the, vi the vector to move away quickly because it's already acquired the virus. So that's different different effects. The viruses are causing different effects in the plant depending on what suits their vector. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Semoga yeah. sudah jelas ya, Rafi. Atau masih ada yang kurang jelas, silakan langsung. Sudah, Bu. Sudah ya, okay. The next thank question. You, the next question is from mm -hmm, Ashila Anya Al Tafa. Yeah, good morning, sir. I read some article that say cigarette stuff could be a natural pesticide. Is it effective for all plants or only for some? Thank you, sir. Could, could you repeat that, please, Utri? Uh, I read some articles that say cigarette stuff could be a natural pesticide. Is it effective for all plants or only for some? Is that cigarette? Cigarette. Uh, I think... Ash. Ash. Tabak. Uh, the tobacco. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I can, uh, well, that's an interesting one. Um, the only thing I could say there is that I know that Nicotine is a very, very toxic insecticide. Um, it's it's was used in the past to fumigate glass houses and so on. So I can imagine cigarette ash would have some nicotine. So it's it may well be toxic to vectors. Yeah. But toxic to people too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And not That's good. Right. <laughs> uh, they're not encouraging people to smoke. <laughs> okay, the next question is, is from our teaching staff from uh, uh, Mr. Joko Priono. 
Professor yeah. John Thomas, what is the feasibility of biological control of insect vector for controlling the spread of plant viruses by insect vectors? Do you not mention by control as an option for controlling insect vector in your presentation slide? Thank you. Um, for most of the serious virus disease, vector transmitted virus diseases, we don't have good biological control. Um, I mean, biological control works very well for, say, control of mites in glass houses. Um, but for field control of aphids or white flies, I'm not aware of any good practical examples yet where it does work. You, you can certainly find um, predators and parasites of vectors, but they're not effective enough in a field situation to establish and to prevent disease spread. And also with many vectors, you don't need very large populations to cause problems. And so I was saying with the white flies, if you kill 90% of the white flies in, in many crops in Indonesia, the remaining 10% is still enough to totally infect the crop. So that's why I haven't mentioned biological control because it's, it's not a practical means at this stage. It'd be very nice if it was. It'd be a very good one to use. Yeah. Thank you. Mudah-mudahan sudah jelas ya Pak Joko. Kemudian saya uh, ada pertanyaan lagi. Saya kok belum melihat pertanyaan dari mahasiswa bioekologi patogen malah. Ya, tolong uh, pertanyaannya ya. Uh, this is from Novi Irawati. Uh, she said farmers uh, using formalin to control uh, paper yellow leaf curl viruses, and it caused uh, the plant uh, better after formalin treatment and uh, yellowing also decrease uh, do you know about the effect of uh, formalin in this case no <laughs> i don't haven't heard of that one either that's another oh Another very dangerous <laughs> approach, I think. Yeah, yeah. Formalin's not very good to use. Um, I can imagine the formalin's quite toxic to the vectors. And yeah, no, I I don't know. Don't know the answer to that. That's it. Sh it shouldn't have any controlling effect on the virus. Rep the virus replication in the plant. It shouldn't be changing that at all. Um, I can see that it could be toxic to to insects, but once again, very toxic to people. So. Yes, that's, no, that's right. all I. But I'll I'll mm -hmm. make a note of that and see what I can find. And it's very bad too in the environ, environmental. Oh yes, terrible. It's yeah. bad, and and that's the. That's one of the problems when disease outbreaks can be very severe in in farmers' fields, and there's lots of very dangerous things are tried, but to no, to no to no effect. But they're very dangerous to the farmers. They just they don't understand that it's not not very effective and it's um, dangerous to them. Okay. Uh... We back to meet Tau Rohma. The second question is related with uh, vector uh, control. Uh, you said chemical control is less effective to control plant virus infection. Uh, and yeah. you suggested using a resistant uh, variety or uh, eliminate the old uh, plant yeah. the, the, is it your suggestion. But yeah. it seems it's very difficult for millibug uh, transmitted viruses, and also yes. especially uh, in uh, estate uh, estate crop. So, do you have any yeah. suggestion to control uh, millibug transmitted uh, virus on estate uh, crops? 
Yes, they're very difficult. <laughs> I have severe mealybug problems in my banana plants in the glass house all the time. <laughs> they're very difficult to control. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the difficulty with mealybugs is that they <clears throat> they can hide. <clears throat> excuse me, more water. <clears throat> Yes, the me mealybugs can <coughs> the mealybugs can hide under the leaves and under the bark of trees, under the leaf sheaths in bananas. So contact treatments <coughs> are not very good. You can use oil sprays for them, for instance, which are effective, but they're contact. So if you don't actually make contact with the mealybug, the spray is no use. Um, an interesting way that mealybugs have been controlled in pineapples in Hawaii, I remember, there's a disease called mealybug wilt, which is associated with viruses that are mealybug transmitted. <clears throat> they put barriers around the field to stop ants moving because ants tend the mealybugs. They protect them from um, predators um, and if the mealybugs, if the ants are not present, then the mealybugs are subject to the predators a lot more and their populations don't build up. So that was one, in, one very interesting way of controlling mealybugs. But mealybugs, unfortunately, say in a plantation crop, you probably are looking at insecticide control to control those. But possibly with injections. <laughs> Not sprays. Right. Okay. Uh, do you have any idea about? I'm interested with the uh, oil, oil treatment. Yeah. What kind yeah. of oil is uh, applied in this case? They're, they're min mineral oils. There are a number of commercially mineral. available, yeah, paraffin oil thing. There's a number of them commercially available for for spraying crops with. Um. But not we, cooking oil because cooking oil is uh, less cheap, cheaper than. Yeah, yeah. No, unfortunately, <laughs> I mean soap and water is quite good for aphids. <laughs> That's fairly cheap. Yep. But the the oils are quite quite effective with um with controlling banana bunchy top virus in Australia, which is a persistently transmitted, um, circulatively transmitted. Um, nanovirus transmitted by aphids. We inject plants with herbicide to kill them. But before doing anything, we spray the whole plant with mineral oil because that stops the aphids flying off the plant and spreading it to another plant when you're eradicating the infected plant. So that's a routine part of the, the virus control is to use oil sprays. But they're, they're contact sprays again. If you don't actually put the oil on the vector, then the vector won't die. And any new leaves that are produced aren't covered with oil. So that's the, the difficult part, but it's non-toxic, which is a good part and non-persistent. Uh, okay, thank you for the answer. I, I hope uh, Mithal Rohma will understand because she worked with uh, Estate crop. Yeah. And next, uh, from Zaida Fairuza, I have an experience in giving recommendation to planter that having infected plant by virus to spray or control the vector, and it was quite effective. But we have no idea for, idea for the infected plant except to eradicate them. Do you have any experience how to neutralize the plant? from the virus or erase the virus from the plant so the new suit from the plants are virus free and for the uh, acyl sucrose can we produce that outside the plant and transfer it to the plant so the vector will not attack the plants right um, the first part of the question is in general the plants are systemically infected which means the whole plant is infected so if you remove part of the plant, the virus is still present. 
in the remainder of the plant. So that doesn't work for most most viruses, especially vegetable viruses, it wouldn't work. Sometimes with viruses in plantation crops in trees, you get uneven distribution. So not every part of the plant will have virus in it, but it's still very difficult to eliminate the virus by eliminating part of the plant. In general, you say that's not, that's not possible. Um, and a very good good point about the um, acetyl sucrose, I don't know. Um, I don't know if it's a difficult thing to, to produce. Um, I don't think we know anything about the, the quantities and delivery mechanism because it's secreted onto the leaf from the leaf hairs. Yeah, that's, that's how it naturally occurs, but yeah, I think that's a very good idea to investigate that. Sudah sudah jelas ya. Mana nih dari uh, member bioekologi patogen nih? Baru Zaida saja, yang oh, lain coba you. ya. Thank you, Prof. Ya. Berikutnya adalah dari uh, question from uh, Dr. Purnama Hidayat. I just wondering, yeah. does acyl sucrose can be found in any trichome in certain plants? Our experience consistently show that the higher the density of leaf trichome, the higher the population of egg and names of the white fly in soybean. Hmm. Yep. Um, no, can't answer that. I don't know. I'll, I'll hand that back to the entomologist. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I really don't know. Um, I know certainly with as far as the density of leaf hairs goes, I think that certainly does not inhibit aphids either. You get very high populations of aphids on plants with very dense trichomes and leaf hairs. So it's not just the physical presence of the leaf hairs that's important, it's certainly what they're secreting. Yep. Yep. Uh, thank you. Begitu jawabannya, Pak Pur. Berikutnya adalah uh, the next question. It's still from uh, our teaching staff here, Dr. Gianto. Endosymbion bacteria has complex interaction with vector, as you said, secreted specific protein in protecting virus, or in another way, prevent virus transmission. Is there any research in your lab to elaborate this mechanism and use it for virus plant disease? Could you could you repeat that, please? Uh, Endosymbion bacteria oh, yeah. has yeah. complex interaction with vector, as you said, secreted specific protein in yeah. protecting virus or in another way prevent mm. virus transmission. Yeah. Is any research in your lab to elaborate this mechanism and use it for virus plant diseases? Yeah, no, not in my laboratory, but in many other laboratories. There's a lot of work being done on that. Um, there are, we still, people are still trying to understand what the actual interactions between the different endosymbionts are, because white flies have a number of endosymbionts and they they can be different species and different genera to what aphids have. And different aphids can have different combinations of endosymbionts. And even the same species of aphid can have different symbionts. Um, and some seem to be closely linked to virus transmission, others not. Um, in aphids, when antibiotics are used to kill the en endosymbionts with some um, poleroviruses, I think, virus transmission is stopped. So when the endosymbiont is there, you get virus transmission. If you kill the endosymbiont, the virus transmission stops. But also the aphid does not live as well because the aphid gets a lot of nutrient from the endosymbionts, a lot of amino acids. Um, the endosymbionts, well, some of them, like um, 
buchnera in, in aphids produces a chaperone protein. It's a protein that protects other proteins and also helps them fold up into their active structures. And it was shown to bind to virus particles. So it was thought that the, that protein helped um, protect the virus particles from degradation. But when people have looked in the aphid to find where that chaperone protein is, it's not in the blood system where the virus is. So if you do the work in the laboratory, you know, test tube, they act, they interact, but in the aphid, they don't seem to, in aphids. But it seems like they might in white flies that might be protecting the aphids, the virus in white flies. So there's a lot of, a lot of questions there. We know the endosymbionts are impor very important in transmission, but we still don't know exactly why. But there's a, yeah, there's a lot of active work on that in other laboratories. Semoga cukup jelas Pak Gianto atau mau dikomentari, silakan. Cukup jelas Putri, yang jelas ada penelitiannya yang menarik sekali. <laughs> Okay. Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting yeah. research. Yeah. Okay, the next question is from Rafi again. Arif Rafi again. How yeah. your experience with applying a plant barriers to prevent virus from coming to our plants? Ah. So, there are some examples of that working okay, but in general, it's not very effective. I could probably direct that one to Boo Asti. He's done ex experiments in our joint project on exactly that. I think if I'm, if I remember correctly, there's an indication that it might work a little bit, but it's not the whole answer. Mm. Would you like to comment, Boo Asti? Uh, yes, thanks, John. Yeah, I think we are uh, trying different kind of uh, control strategy for um, yellow little viruses on on uh, chili pepper, and uh, actually the application of a plant border or plant barrier is one of the recommendation mm. that we give to the farmers mm. because uh, it is very easy to apply. Uh, but there is a crucial, crucial time how to apply this uh, plant barrier in the uh, in the field. Uh, one is that the the plant, the plant border or the plant uh, that we use for the barrier has to be planted uh, several um, weeks ahead before we transplanted the uh, chili pepper. So. And in that case, uh, when we transplanted the chili pepper, the barrier is already there to protect the plants from the movement of the insect factor into the plants. That is one uh, uh, recommendation. Another one is we have to use the barrier plants or border plants that has the high the, the high is uh, higher than the plant that we are protected. So for example, when we want to protect chili paper, usually we uh, use like a corn plants for the border, or maybe we can use the uh, yard long bean because it is uh, quite high. So it can uh, protect the movement of the uh, insect from outside the plants. But uh, I'm agree with uh, John that uh, we cannot uh, rely only with the, uh, the plant barrier or plant border to protect our plants. We have to apply also other uh, control strategy, I think. Putri. Yeah. Terima kasih tambahannya, Bu Asti. Uh, there's another question. We still have uh, 17 minutes before closing so right. if uh, another question we still opened another question from you from uh, IPB student or from alumni or from stitching staff for other from other uh, university so 
I will let you and please write in the chat or you can directly asking Dr. Jones directly. Uh, another question is from students is how to differentiate uh, directly between uh, plant infected by virus and uh, plant in, uh, because of uh, uh, environmental or abiotic factor. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, because the symptom is very similar, mm -hmm. uh, if we misdiagnose the causal of the uh, symptom, uh, it will uh, miss. Uh, it will lead mis uh, miscontrol. Yep. Okay. Um, that's a very good question. And. When I talk to our students and give them a lecture on virus symptoms, the first thing I tell them is that if somebody can tell you that a plant is virus infected, 100% sure, they're probably not telling the truth because it is so difficult. Um, there are there are many symptoms. Let's say many viruses can cause the same symptom. So it's hard to know what virus is causing a symptom. And there are also many effects on plants that look like viruses, but they're not. And in the diagnostic part of our, <clears throat> our laboratory, I would say we get a lot of samples when people don't know what it is. They think it's not a fungus. It's not a bacterial disease. Therefore, it must be a virus disease. That's the thought, the way they think. And probably half the samples we get are not virus. They can be insect feeding damage, chemical spray damage, um, nutrient deficiency, nutrient toxicity, phytoplasmas, or sometimes you know, fungal or bacterial infections. So it can be very difficult. That's the first thing you've got to understand is it's not easy. And then it's experience to look at exactly what the symptoms are like. Um, chim chimeras can be very confusing. You know, leaf colors, changes in plants, they're genetic changes, but they tend to have very sharp color changes. Virus infections tend to be more more smooth changes. So they're the sorts of things that you get by experience to tell the difference between them. So some viruses have very distinctive symptoms and they're not too difficult to identify. Other ones can be very difficult and it can be experience. And it's very dangerous to be too overconfident. So, I'll leave. Does that make sense? Gimana, Ahmad? Ahmad? Yeah, Bu. Terima kasih, Bu. Cukup jelas. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you understand the, next... the answer? Yes. He's understood. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the next question is from Kansa Amara. He lives uh, in Sidoarjo near three uh, sugarcane company. Mm. So uh, at the present, only one uh, remain. Two of them uh, collapse because of uh, the production. Uh, it's not uh, uh, decreased. Mm. And uh, because of the virus, SGNV, sugarcane mosaic mm. virus, mm. and yeah. sugarcane strict mosaic virus yeah. uh, so the question is uh, how to give some information to farmers sugarcane farmers and the sugarcane company staff to control the virus because uh, until the present sugarcane company only focused to control the insect not mm. the virus 
Yeah. Yeah, right. We get lots of difficult questions. <laughs> That's yeah, because yeah. many students are interested in yeah. uh, how to control viruses. Yeah. Um, with sugarcane mosaic virus, <clears throat> that's a potty virus. So that's one of the viruses that is non-circulatively transmitted. So it's spread by many different aphid species. Um, the st different strains of sugarcane mosaic virus can have a, a fairly wide host range. So they infect plants other than sugarcane as well, many grasses. So the virus can be in the plants around the sugarcane field, as well as in other sugarcane fields. Um, and many different aphid species can spread the disease and it's non-circulatively transmitted. So that means very short feeding times, which makes control by insecticides very difficult. So, that's a that's a case where spraying the crop is not likely to work. Um, in Australia, SCMV in sugarcane is controlled by resistant varieties. So there's a it's a major part of the breeding program for sugarcane is to have resistance to the major dis diseases, and sugarcane mosaic virus is one of them. So in the case of sugarcane, resistance is probably the best, the best means. And there are lots of resistant sugarcane varieties available. I think the USA does a lot of breeding in sugarcane. So, so practical control can be difficult. Once the plants in the field, control can be quite difficult for those crops. It's a long-term strategy of resistance there. So the best is a uh, resistant variety. Yep. Yeah, because I know the sugar cane vi infecting virus, viruses, it's easily uh, transmit mechanically. Yes. Also by and cutting knife. Exactly. By cutting knife and by the sugar cane sets. Sugar cane so it's vegetatively yeah. propagated. Yeah. So like I said, at the very beginning of the lecture, that's one very good way of transmitting viruses in planting material. So of course, that's another thing you do. You try to get healthy planting material. Start with a clean crop. Uh, begitu, Kansa, penjelasannya. Mudah-mudahan cukup jelas ya, Kansa. Ya, Ibu, cukup jelas. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from our teaching staff, Dr. Uh, Dewi Sartiami, Dear John. Is it any concern to develop vaccine for plant? Thank you. Yes, very difficult. Once again, very difficult. Um, it, it's been an on an ongoing area of work because you're basically looking at um, genetic engineering approaches for the equivalent of a vaccine, I think. Um, one interesting area that's being done by a number of groups in the world, including colleagues of mine at the university, is to use um, double-stranded RNA from short segments of double-stranded RNA from plant viruses <clears throat> that are packaged in nanoparticles of clay. So tiny little bits of viral RNA or double-stranded RNA from the virus in tiny nanoparticles, so microscopic little particles in clay that are then sprayed onto the plant. And that is to induce RNAi, so RNAi interference in control of the disease that way. And that seems to work for a number of different viruses. It's still in the experimental phase and field trials, but that's that sort of approach is one sort of similar to a vaccination. Bagaimana Bu Dewi? Katanya ada perlakuan dengan penyemprotan menggunakan clay itu apa ya? Clay clay itu tanah liat Putri. Oh, tanah liat nanopartikel ya. Nanopartikel tanah liat yang disemprotkan ke 
ke daun itu bisa uh, mengendalikan virus namun hmm. masih dalam riset itu pembawanya atau ininya ya partikelnya eh, pembawanya tapi ya artinya kan double strand RNA gitu ya ya ya, ya, RNA, ya di, di, di inkorporasi di dalam uh, clay okay. uh, baik uh, berikutnya uh, mungkin kita masih punya waktu 6 menit lagi we have we still have a six minutes uh, for discussion so saya silakan persilakan kepada bapak ibu yang uh, teaching staff bapak ibu dari departemen proteksi atau dari mahasiswa masih saya persilakan mungkin dua pertanyaan lagi silakan Pak mahasiswa Gianto? yang langsung putri yang mau nanya langsung iya, boleh. Mahasiswanya malu-malu. Saya sampai belepotan ini menerjemahkan. <laughs> Silakan mahasiswa yang mau langsung bertanya. Silakan. Ini ada oh, kok menurun jadi 139 ini. Please. Hmm. Pak Widodo barangkali. Ya. Yeah. Uh, I, I just wrote uh... Uh, in uh, in the chat, actually, uh, uh, as you said that uh, the uh, factor of eating behavior is affected by the leaf color. Yes. Especially yellow, yellowing leaves. Yes. Is there I... any, uh, for example, uh, uh, nutrient deficiency or nutrient disorder causing yellowing also uh, yeah. affected the eating behavior of the factors? Yes, I, I read your question. But I've been trying to type an answer, but I, I can't concentrate well enough. <laughs> so, um, and I say that that is a very good question because um, I don't know that anybody's tested that, but it does make sense because many viruses, like luteoviruses and poliaroviruses, produce yellowing symptoms just like nutrient deficiencies, and they were weren't discovered for a long, the viruses weren't discovered for a long time because people thought they were nutrient deficiencies. You can't, and that's an example where symptoms can be very difficult to understand. Barley yellow dwarf virus, for instance, potato leaf roll virus, um, these yellowing symptoms. So quite possibly aphids would be attracted to the color. But then the next factor would be what volatiles the plant might be giving off because the metabolism of the plant would be different yes. when it's virus infected compared to being nutrient deficient. Yes. Well, they might be different. The virus might be causing nutrient deficiency. <laughs> so that's a- You mean VOC, volatile organic compound, that may be, may be different? VOC, volatile <laughs> organic compound, volatile. Yeah. Volatile, yes. Yes. They, they might be different. They might be the same. Okay. We don't, yeah. don't know. Okay. But that's a that's a very good question. Yeah. One one more question. One more yes. question. Based on my uh, fit observation, that uh, the spread of uh, virus in uh, in eggplant is slower yeah. than in chili pepper, mm. and spread by wet fly. Are there, uh, have you any ideas? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> It could be a number of factors. It depends which virus you're talking about, but you're probably talking about the um, white fly transmitted Begamo viruses. Yeah. Um, and it depends which one of those viruses it is to start with. Because the eggplant and the chili might not have the same virus. Um, and the concentration of the virus in the plant could well be different. Yeah. Maybe the chili, chili plant is, the virus might be twice as concentrated. So it's much more easy for the vector to pick it up and spread it. Yeah. Yeah. And also how willingly the, the vector will feed on the two different plant species. Yes. You say there's all those different factors for, for attraction and feeding and so on. So all of those things, even if it's the same virus in both plants, all those factors could um, be different between the two different plant species. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Professor, I thought that uh, the 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 eggplant is uh, more suitable for 
the white fly and then they yeah. stay over there because yeah. the, the, what is the, the horse is very suitable for their, yeah. their nutrition. But, but maybe they don't they don't like to move off it. They mm. like to stay and not move because so there's the roof then then. Yeah, uh, for, uh, be... the paper is not uh, less less paper or less suitable than yeah, move yeah, to yeah. anywhere like that. I yeah, don't like that. It, yeah, it could be quite hard to find the white mm. flies on the chili, mm. but they can yeah. be on all the plants around the chili. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, that's probably a case where the virus is being encouraged to encouraging the white fly to move around in the chili a bit more, spread it more. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, good, thank good, you, John. Good, good, good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any question? One more question. Right. So I would. Okay. Yes. Ah. Maybe an easy one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the last question from Pito Dafa Monta. Yep. Uh, uh, he he's as, asking about the virus that multiply in the insect vector. Is yeah. it any uh, different, big different, uh, to virus retention or effectivity or or others? Yeah. Um, yes, it does. Um, yeah, how do I answer that one? Um, it the virus is retained for a long, for the life of the insect in that case, um, if the virus multiplies in the insect. But then, for many of the other circulatively transmitted viruses where the virus does not replicate, they are also infective for life. And they still seem to be able to transmit fairly effectively through the life of the eight of the the vector. So, just the fact that it's infect the insect is infected doesn't mean it's transmitting the virus for longer. Um, what it does mean sometimes is that the the young live, let's say aphids, for instance, that are produced can also be infected when they're born. It's um, like like HIV being transmitted to, to babies from mothers. That can happen with the infective aphids, whereas that doesn't happen for the aphids that are not infected. Um, sometimes being infected also reduces the fitness of the aphids. In cases where the aphid doesn't live as long and doesn't breed as much as a non-infected aphid. And in cases like that, you don't really know whether the virus is a virus of the aphid that's managed to infect plants or whether it's a plant virus that's managed to infect aphids. You don't know what the primary primary host is. <laughs> yeah, but there aren't there aren't too many examples of that TOSPO virus is transmitted by thrips are one one good example where the virus replicates in the in the vector. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, there's uh, one last question. I yeah. think uh, brief question. It's related because you Zaida said uh, uh, the, about the uh, Zaida asking about the biocontrol agent for the vector. Hmm. Uh, is it any any experience uh, your exper based on your experience uh, about the ecosystem management to prevent the virus attack? Yeah, like like I said before, I think there aren't any good examples of biocontrol. Um, in the natural environment. Um, there's been a lot of say, searching, for instance, for banana bunchy top virus, which is a very serious disease of bananas in many, many countries, um, which is aphid transmitted. There have been a few 
spire control agents found, but none of them can be established. What normally happens with the bio control agents in, in nature is that when the population builds up a lot, it's attacked by the parasites or by the predators. Um, the aphid population is decimated. The, vec the bio control agent has nothing to feed on and it dies. And then the aphids build up again. So you go through cycles up and down with populations. Um, and it doesn't seem to be a good way of maintaining the population of the vector at a very low level all the time. Um, yeah, so basically, I don't, the people have done a lot of looking for good biocontrol agents in, for the, in a field situation, but it's too difficult to control the populations under those circumstances because the the biocontrol agents have their own control agents as well. Something, something to feed on them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Raida, sudah jelas ya? Insya Allah, Bu. Ya, yeah, oke. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much Thank for you. all the question and also the answer from Dr. John. For, uh, so, we, we close the discussion session. For the next session is the, we will give you uh, a certificate appreciation, certificate oh, uh, appreciation for certificate from our department. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. very good. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, because you uh, come here even virtually to give yeah. uh, to share the knowledge with us, to share your mm. your precious time with us. So we would like yeah. to thank, and this is the uh, uh, a kind of uh, appreciation for you. Yeah. Okay, no, thank, thank you very you. much. I yeah. I thoroughly enjoy coming to Indonesia. It's a it's a pity. It's a tragedy that we have our COVID situation. Yeah. Otherwise, I would have been there already again this year. Yeah, yeah. I look forward to being able to visit visit personally as soon as it's possible. And so I've had a long working experience with Bu Asti. And it's yeah. been a very enjoyable experience for many, many years. So I thoroughly enjoy that. And also we have, um, <clears throat> let's see, Ita is a student in our laboratory at the moment doing her PhD. So we've got constant interaction with our Indonesian colleagues. It's always been very good. So thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. So uh, please, uh, please stay a while, Dr. John, because uh, at the last, at the end, of uh, Buasti will have a, a closing remark, yeah, okay. kind of closing remark. And before that, uh, I would like to uh, uh, inform you about the next guest lecture. Uh, please, uh, the slide. Uh, don't forget to uh, absent, yeah. Jangan lupa absent. The next guest lecture is uh, will be held on for uh, November 4 to 2020 uh, on 9 to. 11 p.m. by Dr. Fe de la Cuera. It's related with update on plant virus detection method. So don't forget to register yourself via this link. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I'm so sorry if my English is not so good for you, John. Oh, it's, for been, all of it's you. been excellent. It's been excellent. <laughs> no need to apologize there. <laughs> I prefer Japanese, actually. <laughs> <laughs> because I lived a long time in uh, in Japan, so I'm for very, in, uh, the last, I will uh, give the last moment to Bu Asti to give a closing remark. Silakan Bu Asti. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ibu Tri Asmira, for uh, being the moderator for the guest lecture. Uh, I think the presentation by uh, John is very uh, interesting and enlightening. Uh, I uh, actually I'm uh, agree with John uh, about the complication on the virus factor relationships. Uh, I think John already uh, explained how complicated it is. Uh, 
there is another uh, subject John, that you have not uh, explained yet about the uh, the situation where one single insect not only acquire one virus right mm. they can only uh, they can also uh, acquire mm. yeah, more than one virus so it make the relationships more complicated <laughs> yeah okay so but yes thank you very much uh, john really appreciate your time and your willing to uh, give the lecture for all the students in ITB University. I think we still have uh, uh, times and we still have uh, some opportunities to work more on the research, on the virus uh, research, I think. And I hope by uh, listening to your lectures, more students will be interested to do uh, research on plant virology. Yeah. <laughs> because usually they try to avoid plant virology, John. <laughs> I, I can't, can't understand that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so hopefully by uh, this uh, occasion, this event, there are more and more students would like to do research on plant virology because you not only learn about a virus, but you also learn about insect. You also learn about uh, uh, plans you also learn many things so it's not only about the virus itself yeah, yeah. thanks right. again John. okay well, i hope i can visit some of the students when i next visit oh. your laboratory yes <laughs> I hope they're there. exactly hope you've, uh, hope you've attracted some to virology yes <laughs> next time you come you will be welcomed yeah. by more students yeah, in the lab <laughs> yes. okay we hope hope so yep. yeah Okay. Thank you. Thank, well, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Okay. Uh, no, thank you, Dr. John, for your yeah. lecture, your nice, interesting, enlightening lecture for us. Yeah. And also, thank you for our student and also participant from outside the IPB. Uh, thank you, and we will wait for your uh, your coming in uh, the next lecture next week. So don't forget. And I will uh, close the uh, guest lecture today. Thank you very much again for John. Uh, stay thank you safe. for the excellent moderation. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Uh, stay safe at home and yeah. uh, avoid COVID. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and stay safe, everybody. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, John. Bye. Bye. Terima kasih semua, ya. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Ya, sama-sama, Bu. Terima kasih. Saya di kebun, nih. Saya di kebun, nih. Di kebun, tuh, mau hujan. Uh, Bu Evi, saya serahkan Bye. pada panitia, Bu Evi. Terima kasih, uh, Bu Tri, Bu Asti. Thank you, John John. It's like now. Sudah, sudah. For November, uh, register now because the seat is limited. <laughs> uh, tentang virus juga, ya. Jadi, jadi perkembangan terbaru tentang virus sekarang seperti apa? Jadi mohon kehadiran teman-teman semua, Bapak Ibu juga, karena kita belajar banyak. Saya juga, oh iya ya, udah lupa-lupa virusnya cerita tentang virus ter enlighten lagi. Okay. Ada dua price ya? Enggak Bu Bu Evi, itu yeah. untuk guest lecture. <laughs> Kalau ada guest ada door prize kayak pada door prize-nya lebih semangat lagi nih. Iya, <laughs> yeah. nanti kita minta departemen ya. Kita minta apa departemen? Uh, sebenarnya minta juga uh, kepada Bapak Ibu yang lain kalau punya rekan-rekan kolega di luar supaya ini kan baru yang ketiga nih kalau ada lagi uh, kan tengah semester berikutnya kan bisa diinkludkan dalam uh, salah satu chapter mata kuliah. Nah, uh, ya kita usahakan banyak yang hadir bisa hadir sama-sama di situ nantinya. 
Sama kali ya, enggak? Entomologi ada, Bu. Saya dari Korea ada. Wevi. Saya dari Korea ada. Jadi mungkin di akhir November. Oke. Okay. Dan kalau masih ada waktu lagi nanti di Desember mungkin juga ada. Nah, terakhir mungkin. Desember sebelum sebelum Natal ya, kayaknya kuliah udah berakhir ya. Iya, iya. Oke. Okay. Berarti kapan harus... kapan ber- terakhir kuliah Bu Tri? Bu sebelum Evi. kayaknya beberapa hari sebelum Natal, Bu. Hmm. Kan minggu depan kan full itu. Jadi kayaknya dua minggu dua Dua minggu Desember, minggu ke iya. minggu tiga mungkin masih ada sih itu ya. Iya, ya. beberapa hari lah sebelum itu. Dan iya. Rasanya UTS juga sudah, Bu. Eh, UAS juga udah, Bu, di situ. Sudah termasuk. Jadi Desember tuh kayaknya UAS kali ya, rasanya ya. Hmm. Iya, 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 iya. Oke. Okay. Jadi mohon okay. Bapak-Ibu yang lain dari bagian Hama, Pak Pur, satu ya. Iya, yeah. November kemungkinan... 20 atau 27 November Jumat pagi juga. Baik. Terus mungkin ya nemat Dokter Li, ya, namanya Dokter Li ya. Santi kebetulan di sana jadi mungkin kalau masih ada yang ingat Santi oh, ya. Oh iya. Iya, 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 iya. Ya, belajar entomologi di sana sekarang. Iya. Oke. Mungkin kalau masih ada waktu lagi nanti mungkin yang dari Jerman juga ada. Dari Hawaii juga ada, jadi uh, masih ya, banyak, Bu Evi. Ya. Oke, okay, terima kasih. Terima kasih, terima kasih banyak, semuanya, Bu Evi, Bu Asti, Bu Evi, Pak Pur, tadi ada Pak Teguh, ada Pak Joko, terima kasih. Oke. Okay. Ditunggu gosennya, Bu Evi, ya? Iya. <laughs> Lunch, lunch, lunch. Enggak ada Pak Hadep ya. Oh, oh, gak ada. Gak ada ya Pak Hadep? Enggak ada. Oh, ada cabai banyak, ambil sendiri itu. Pak Wit tuh, Pak Wit. Tahunya mana tahunya? Nah, itu, saya cuma bawa minum sama cabai, gimana enggak tahu. Eh, tahunya enggak ada. Cabai panen di kebun, Pak. Cabai banyak kena alat buah nih. Oke. Okay. Oke deh, makasih. Terima kasih semua. Makasih. Ya, Bu, Mbak Ana, makasih Ana, ya. Ana, makasih. Yuk, pamit ya, pamit. Pamit semua. Makasih banyak. Makasih kerjasamanya. Terima kasih.